Hello Penguinauts, I'm the Betty Penguin and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program Beyond Kerbal. Sorry it's been a little while but university has been absolutely hectic, it's been deadline after deadline after deadline. I've got three <laughs> massive group projects ongoing at the moment. Who would have believed that doing an actual degree in rocket science is quite difficult and rather time consuming. Um, but don't worry, I have been working on episodes as and when I have free time um, and I should have a lot more free time at Christmas. But uh, but yeah, you guys are just going to have to put up with that. And I've said this many times, but I seem to have quite a few new viewers on this series. But this is not a job for me. This is entirely a hobby. It's why I've never set up a patron. I don't add ridiculous amounts of adverts to all my videos. You know, a little bit of money I get from YouTube is nice, but I've never done it for money. It's just because I enjoy it. Uh, and as such, I've never had an upload schedule. You know, I just upload as and when I have time. And most of you seem very understanding of that. So thank you very much. So, moving on to today's antics. If you recall, in the last episode, we sent up all the building materials we needed to begin orbital construction of our next interplanetary spacecraft named the Constellation, which will be heading to the Wasteland, which is the new name for Kerbin, the planet that we have long since left behind. Now, we did visit the Wasteland in the previous series, Endurance, but it was only basically a flying visit. We descended to the surface, explored the old KSC, and went back up again. So this is going to be a much more long-term Mission. We're also going to explore the moon of the wasteland Malice. So in the last episode as I said we launched all the building materials But we also need to launch all of the fuel for the spacecraft We don't get all that for free We need to build the spacecraft and then put all of the resources that we need in it um, As well once you've actually constructed it So that is what we are launching here using our pulsar launch vehicle Which uh, we've managed to stretch out to launch about 250 tons into orbit I think if we added some larger first stage boosters we could probably even get that up to 300 350 tons in the future uh, but we didn't really have a need to do that surprisingly we did manage to launch all of the fuel for this spacecraft in one launch it shows just how much easier it is to actually build things in orbit two launches and boom we have an interplanetary spacecraft with all the various components ready to go whereas if we assembled it traditionally i'm sure it would take two or three launches just for the main mothership and then a launch for each of the individual segments and uh yeah considering the <laughs> just the mobile base itself uh, weighs 120 tons yeah <laughs> it would have been quite difficult to get all of this stuff into orbit in pieces. This is also considerably cheaper to launch just the building materials and construct it all in orbit because some of the parts of this spacecraft are very expensive, especially the propulsion systems, but we'll get onto that a little later. So you see they're just docking that gigantic fuel module there on and uh, just behind the building materials. And then now what we're going to do is just remove that third stage and send it back to solitude so much like in the last episode we are just going to be sending back the engine because every time we've ever tried to send back the fuel tank as well it's ended with a bit of an explosive fireball so just the orbiting there and you see we've got some sort of auxiliary fuel tanks there so the aim of that is essentially if we used up all of the fuel in that third stage we would still have enough fuel to deorbit, um, and that's just stored in those fuel tanks there behind the heat shield and it does also um, move the center of mass of this now heat shield engine combo to make sure it doesn't actually uh, flip around because you want the center of mass really as far forward as possible uh, to prevent it flipping around and destroying that rather expensive vacuum engine I mean I say rather expensive we really don't need to be going to all the effort of actually <laughs> recovering these uh, third stage engines considering how much money we have and the fact that money is just not a problem anymore. We're almost in a post scarcity era with all our mining operations on the, the moon of Nemesis but uh, still it's quite fun. It's a nice sort of engineering challenge to be able to reuse this third stage engine and I think it's, uh, it's quite a bit of fun to try and reuse as much as the rocket as you can. But now after construction Construction going on for about three weeks we have finally constructed the constellation and so once we have it all fueled up all we need now is the crew so this is a little bit of um, a joke <laughs> a very nerdy joke um, but yeah I got a new mod uh, well actually two new mods um, because 
we didn't really have a very exciting collection of command modules. So I had a little look around and I found a wonderful set of mods called the Near Future mods. And I have heard of them before and seen them, but I didn't realise that Near Future Spacecraft adds a bunch of really cool looking command pods. So I got Near Future Spacecraft's command pods. I, I removed a lot of the engines and stuff that we didn't need since we've already got loads of engines and fuel tanks. So we pretty much just took the command pods and some other bits and bobs. But we also got Near Future launch vehicles, which adds a bunch of sort of engine mounts and stuff. Uh, at the moment, the bottom of our rockets just sort of have the engines attached to the bottom of the fuel tanks and it looks a little bit janky. Um, so I got that as well. So we've got two new mods and they'll be in the mod list in the description below. But why is this a joke, Beardy? Well, if you look carefully, you'll see that uh, this stage here uses the Blue Origin New Glen landing legs. Okay. But the command module is a SpaceX Dragon capsule. So we've basically made an amalgamation or abomination, some might say, <laughs> of the Blue Origin launch vehicle and the SpaceX crew vehicle, uh, which I found amusing. Probably nobody else does, but you know, us space nerds, we've got to amuse ourselves somehow. So here we go, we have our little crew vehicle here, and I've named this the Sephira. I'm sure some of you can figure out uh, who that's named after. I mean, as if I haven't already made enough Aragon references back in Endurance, but uh, if you don't know, that's my favourite fantasy series. So, what we're doing is we're sending up um, pretty much everything apart from the engineers. We're taking two of the engineers already on Tycho. So, Ben Kerman, who's one of our four original Kerbals. Uh, some people ask where Jeb, Bill, Bob and Val are. Uh, if you think about it, this is set quite a long way into the future. So, they are all long dead. Uh, so, instead, we had Ben, Ted, Katrina and Peter. That was it, Peter. Peter Kerman. Named after uh, Tape Gaming, just you know. I did mention him in the last episode. Maybe, you know, if we say his name three times, he'll... Uh, reappear onto YouTube. So we're taking two engineers off of Tycho since we have six on there and then what we're launching here is uh, two pilots, two uh, scientists for our mothership and then two scientists for our mobile base. Um, so we're going to have a total crew roster of eight Kerbals. So of course we have enough life support uh, and habitation time for all of them. So we're just transferring all of our crew into the Constellation. And now we can sort of see the spacecraft properly. I'm going to go over some of the bits and bobs of this mission. So the names of all the various different sections. Of course we have Constellation, which is the name of the mothership. But then that massive fairing there. <laughs> that is what contains the mobile base and the reason why it's in a massive 20 ton fairing is because of course it's going to have to go through a rather violent atmospheric entry onto the wasteland uh, so we needed to protect it on the way down because a mobile base is believe it or not not very aerodynamic uh, and that is called the Akira base. And Sovereign is the name of our SSTO there. A little crew SSTO on the side we're going to be using to transfer crew to and from the mobile base and then you can see the lander on the other side that is called the Miranda, and that is going to be heading to the moon of the wasteland, Malice. So, those of you who watch a certain science fiction property might be able to come up with a link between those names, Constellation, Akira, Sovereign, and Miranda. Um, the first person to come up with the answer to that, I will peel in your comment. As a little bit of a prize, a little bit of a constellation prize. Um, some people did put in the comments of the last episode, since it was constellation and my base is called Artemis, that maybe I was naming all of my stuff after NASA programs. I mean, that's actually a coincidence, because uh, if you actually have been watching Endurance when I released it, I named my base Artemis before the Artemis program was actually announced, um, just because it's such, I guess it's just such a relevant name uh, to a moon-based program. I did actually name it after the uh, base in the Andy Weir book, Artemis. Um, but yeah, and the reason this is called Constellation is not remotely related to the Constellation program either. So I'm just going to stop those of you who are going to suggest that uh, right now. They are actually all things from science fiction properties. I, I like this sort of naming theme. Um, like, if you recall Morningstar, which is our mission that's heading all the way out to Jewel, uh, all of the components of that mission were named after characters from Red Rising. Uh, so these are all named after certain things from a certain science fiction property and I'll, I'll let you guys know what that is in the next episode but get your comments down below and uh, see if you can guess what that might be. So what we're doing now is just returning our four remaining engineers that were on Tycho down to the surface. Um, I did actually forget to include a probe and since we don't have a pilot on this uh, command module now uh, we don't actually have any SAS but we did manage to re-enter the atmosphere just fine. Um, and I did try and use the uh, Super Draco engines here. And I was originally planning to actually land this propulsively because it has more than enough Delta V. Um, but then I thought about it and thought, you know what? I would rather not just 
risk killing them when I can just put four parachutes on the command module and land it gently in the ocean. But uh, maybe we'll do that in future since uh, that is a capability that we now have. So now we are all fueled up and we're ready to go. So we're starting our excruciatingly long burn towards the wasteland. Beardy, what engine is that you have on the back? I've never seen it before. Well, that is an open cycle nuclear engine. So nuclear engines kind of complicated but we've got a very long burn to go through here uh, this has an acceleration of something like 0.5 meters per second squared something like that either way it's very very low so we're having to do multiple passes uh, in order to actually escape solitude's gravity so a nuclear engine essentially works by passing the propellant through a nuclear reactor, heating it up to very high temperatures and expelling it out the back, which gives you much higher uh, specific impulse and hence efficiency than a traditional chemical rocket, which either uses, if it's a monopropellant engine, it uses uh, thermal decomposition of the propellant, or if it's a bipropellant, it's essentially just burning stuff, combining something like hydrogen and water and getting an exothermic reaction, burning it and spewing it out the back. So you've got a few different designs of nuclear engines though. So the traditional sort of Nerva engine, so in the stock game, that is a solid core nuclear reactor. Um, so it's a solid nuclear reactor like the ones we have here on Earth. So the fuel is contained in rods and you just pass the propellant over that, heating it up. But the maximum temperature of that reactor is severely limited by the components of the reactor because of course you don't want the reactor melting. But then a few bright sparks have the idea of, well, what if you actually let the reactor melt? Not just melt, but get so hot that it actually vaporizes. And that's when you come to gas core nuclear reactor design. So the actual fuel for the reactor is kept in a gas, um, which as you can imagine, is extremely hard to contain and control, uh, hence why they're currently still theoretical. There are a few different sort of plans for how you would contain that fuel, um, whether you do it magnetically, um, there's a few different sort of designs and it all gets very complicated and I don't fully understand it. Um, but essentially, if you let the reactor fuel be a gas, you're only limited by the melting temperature of the walls of the reactor. So you can reach much, much higher temperatures and higher temperatures in an engine are good because higher temperature propellant equals faster propellant, which equals more efficient. So you've got two different sort of types of um, those gas core reactors uh, when it comes to engines. You've got closed cycle and open cycle. And our closed cycle engines are the ones that we used on our Morningstar mission to Jewel. And that's where you contain the reactor within like a graphite um, container and you pass the propellant around the outside of it, which is good because you don't mix the propellant directly with the actual <laughs> the reactor fuel, the horrible radioactive stuff but you lose a lot of efficiency transferring the heat indirectly through the graphite. So our open cycle design here actually passes the fuel straight through the reactor, which means that we have a very radioactive exhaust. So whether or not that's entirely safe to use around your home planet, I don't know. I mean, the, the engine actually has an automatic shut off if you point it towards your home planet um, because you're spewing a bunch of radioactive um, elements out the back of it. But the bonus of that is that you get much, much higher efficiency. So whereas our closed cycle engines on Morningstar got about 1500 seconds of ISP, um, these engines uh, get over 3,000. Now we could have got up to six, 7,000 if we use liquid hydrogen as a fuel, but the problem with using liquid hydrogen on our long-term mission is it boils away and also our thrust would have been so low that I may have actually wanted to cry. So we're using a fuel called Diborane uh, instead, which gives us much, well, about 3,000 seconds of ISP, um, but much higher thrust. So now that's on its way, we've got a few things to do around Artemis. So at the end of the last episode, I proclaimed that Artemis was now fully self-sufficient while showing the colony inventory screen. Somebody very helpfully pointed out to me, uh, Beardy, your water is in the red. Like, seriously in the red. And I had a look at it and I was like, ah, yeah, uh, we're running out of water. Very seriously. So, <laughs> um, I had to actually go and design another module for Artemis, only a small one, but uh, another agriculture support module and also with um, a bonus hydroponics bay just to produce a few more supplies since we have some spare, uh, some spare mulch because mulch is the sort of stuff that the Kerbals produce 
just by uh, eating supplies and you can use agroponics base to convert that uh, back into edible supplies uh, with just a little bit of fertilizer so I stuck that on there even though we do have enough supplies but just to get a few more get more of a stockpile and we have our agriculture support module to produce a little bit more water for us so thankfully now uh, our Kerbals are not going to die of dehydration so now we've made Artemis fully self-sufficient and Constellation is on its way to the wasteland. We don't really have much to do for the final few hundred days until Memento returns home. Now people who are joining in Beyond Kerbal won't remember this mission, but we... Well, it was basically the penultimate episode of Endurance that uh, this mission was actually carried out. So although we did launch it something like halfway through the previous series, which shows just how long this mission has actually been. And it was a sample return mission, so it went all the way out to Drizzen, that's the new name for Drez, uh, and its moon Fisher. And it la uh, landed at a bunch of little landers with surface sample collection drills. And they took surface samples and a bunch of scientific readings from all the different biomes, and one actually landing on the moon Fisher, and returned all those surface samples back to the mothership. And it is been heading back to solitude ever since. And finally, the prodigal son has returned home. It's almost a shame, but uh, this you know, massive long-term mission with a bunch of different parts and everything has really worked out um, pretty much perfectly. And all that's going to be left of it is this tiny little return capture. You see, we've just got um, a science container there containing all of our surface samples and all of our scientific data. And all the rest of it is going to be burnt up in the atmosphere, which is kind of sad. But we didn't have anywhere near enough Delta V to actually put this spacecraft into orbit. And even then, it would just become a piece of space junk. Uh, so we're just just going to let it burn up in the atmosphere and here we have it our sample return returning back to the home world containing yeah surface samples from three different biomes of uh, Drizzen and uh, from one of the biomes from the moon so we're never really going to need to send a manned mission there's just not quite enough to do uh, and it's really quite difficult to reach Drizzen um, so doing a sample return mission like this means we've pretty much got all the science that we needed uh, we haven't had any losses due to transmission because as I said we're actually bringing it all back so uh, it saves us from having to do a major manned mission so we can focus on more exciting manned missions like our one to the wasteland but we get up over 4,000 science from that a massive long-term mission and to be fair although that is a lot of science uh, <laughs> it's really not that much in the long uh, long term sort of scheme of things considering how much science our manned missions churn out with their uh, science labs but using that we can now unlock a few extra tech nodes that have been added by installing near future spacecraft and unlock a number of the new command modules which we will be using in future episodes as well as those engine clusters uh, which will be sticking on the pulsar and our other reusable rockets but that is the end of the episode thank you very much for watching everyone i've been the pd penguin and in the next episode we will be arriving at the wasteland and descending to the surface and exploring the old kerbal space center once more thank you for watching and i'll see you all next time